All right. Um, my name is uh, Justin Gavage, as stated on the board, and I am a uh, a instructor in the Department of Africana Studies here at uh, Dominguez Hills. I think this is my third or fourth lecture that I've done for uh, for Ali, right? So I do appreciate you all continuously uh, inviting me back to be able to discuss uh, with this group. Um, my research interests are in social movements. Uh, I particularly focus on social movements that target uh, strategies for economic development in black communities. Um, I won't focus specifically on that today, but what I'll be looking at is more demonstrations uh, contemporary demonstrations that are being carried out uh, by professional athletes, more specifically uh, the demonstrations that's happening uh, in the NFL uh, for the last couple of years here. Um, we'll discuss those and we'll try to put them into a historical context um, because if we isolate these different demonstrations and uh, forms of protest, then they kind of lose meaning to a certain extent. So uh, one of the things that I want to do is to create a historical context, and then we'll talk about the discourse around these protests and why is it even important for us to look at professional athletes uh, protesting, right? Because this is not the only group of people or professionals that are engaging in protests. So why is it so much discussion on social media uh, and popular media? Um, and other news outlet sources around professional athletes and their uh, decision to engage in protests, right? Um, and then we'll kind of open it up for questions and answers. Is that cool with you all? All right. Um, so first, uh, before we actually get into the protest in terms of uh, professional athletes, are we all aware of the current um, demonstrations that uh, have been going on in terms of the NFL. I know it's kind of somewhat died down the last uh, uh, year, but the prior year was a little bit more uh, common um, and there was more players that were involved. But just to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, everybody aware, who isn't aware if I show hands? And it's fine not to know. All right, so everybody pretty much. All right, so what did you all think about the protests? Well, scratch that question. Let's go back. <laughs> Why was there a protest? From you all's understanding in terms of Colin Kaepernick and uh, other uh, professional players engaging in protest, what was their rationale for engaging in a protest during the American National Anthem? Um, yes. Uh, it was very dark. Um, what was happening police brutality in different cities across in social justice? And uh, they wanted to bring attention to the urgency of what was going on in the country. Okay. So that's one of the uh, rationales in terms of Colin Kaepernick specifically engaging is uh, one to acknowledge uh, challenges that African Americans within the United States have been confronting as it relates to criminal justice system as well as law enforcement, right? The treatment of uh, black and brown communities as it relates to the criminal justice system and law enforcement. Any other rationale that you all heard of? Yes, sir. I years in the national anthem because of the weight of the for publicity and reaction. Okay, so the national anthem became a platform because of the weight that uh, one, our nation puts on it, but two, it's kind of like our declaration to this whole concept of freedom, liberty, and justice to a certain extent. Even though those words are not in the uh, Star Spangled Banner, it represents uh, a notion of freedom that our uh, Pledge of Allegiance kind of alludes to, right? All right? Anything else we know about the demonstrations? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think the method that he used to demonstrate, too, was, in my mind, very respectful. Okay. Okay, so the respect politics has been part of the discussion, right? And uh, as you just stated, it was a peaceful uh, protest or demonstration, right? Um, however, it has been interpreted as something uh, different um, in large or popular media, as we see. And some of the commentators, as it relates to um, some of the sports commentators uh, for the NFL, uh, 
Okay, all right. Anything else that we know about it? All right. Yes. I, I think as an NFL player, he was aware of the national spotlight being on him. All right, definitely. As a sports player or, or a NFL player, he understood the magnitude in terms of a demonstration during that period of time. It's kind of like uh, what was mentioned earlier, the platform. We understood the significance in terms of the Star Spangled Banner, uh, doing not only just sports uh, events, but in terms of our nation in general. All right, and you were going to add on? I think the, the actual protest itself involved the story line. Should you have kept after you've seen what's what's happened? I think you first started just by sitting down, mm -hmm. and you ended up doing a kneel down. I think mean, after discussing with different people, um, it shows more respect that way, and also, um, it also got attention to more attention. Okay, it did start by him sitting down rather than kneeling after consulting with other players, as well as other uh, a service men himself, uh, he was influenced to kneel as a form of respect in terms of those who served our country abroad uh, and other service people who were currently serving the country uh, during that period of time. Okay, one more and then we'll kind of move uh, on. The question of should black and brown people who are affluent question the system was, was brought up, which goes way back, you know, to can we or should we ever question this uh, capitalistic system? Okay, that's actually one of the points that I want to bring up. Um, one of the things that we have to understand as it relates to the demonstration on by professional athletes is that this form of protest is not something that's new, right? In fact, it's connected to a historical movement uh, by marginalized people in this country to stand up and demonstrate to be able to express their discontent with treatment, historical treatment, as well as to acknowledge that we are not free. Um, as articulated by some of the stanzas in our uh, Pledge of Allegiance, as well as the sentiment that's being uh, uh, expressed in the national anthem, if you will, right? And so to talk about some of the objectives, one of the things that I want to do is to place these contemporary demonstrations uh, by professional athletes within a historical context, all right? I uh, also want to talk and define what's been called the black radical tradition. One of the things that we have to be able to attach these demonstrations to is a historical context. That historical context is the black radical tradition, right? Which has been a long historical fight for what we call liberation or freedom to a certain extent, right? The right to be able to be recognized as citizens of this country, but even more specifically for us to be recognized as human beings in the world, right? Um, this black radical tradition that's going to be discussed a little bit later, uh, first discusses or tries to challenge the notion that people of African descent are not human beings, right? Um, and this is a long, I probably need to put that in the context. It has happened for uh, a significant amount of time. If we talk about it within the context of contemporary history, about 500 years. This whole notion of people of African descent are not human beings. Rather, they are units of labor, right? They are units of labor that are expected to produce wealth to a certain extent. And so when we talk about the black radical tradition, we're talking about a tradition of scholars, activists, athletes, entertainers, a community of people that are challenging this whole notion of African people being human beings and being recognized as human beings. They have their own distinct identities. They have their own cultural uh, makeups as well as their own worldview. And worldview, as I discussed before in these groups, not everybody was at those lectures, but Worldview is how we understand the world and how we operate within the world, right? How we understand the world dictates how we interact with the world and others that are in the world. And so this black radical tradition 
is supposed to safeguard African people's understanding on how it, how it means to survive. Y'all follow me so far? Yeah? All right. The next component in terms of the objective is to analyze perspectives that attempt to delegitimize the black radical tradition. And essentially what I mean by this is there is a perspective like those that critique professional black athletes for protesting in terms of is it legitimate? What is your place in terms of demonstrating? You are well off, right? Uh, things that have happened have happened within the letter of the law and the criminal justice system can take care of these things and pass judgment on these different acts uh, that have uh, influenced demonstrations, so on and so forth. So we're analyzing those who attempt to delegitimize the black radical tradition. And the last thing that I'm gonna attempt to do is to discuss the significance of professional athletes engaging in the black radical tradition, all right? So let's start with the first thing in terms of creating a historical context for professional black athletes. What is this historical context? This history or this movement uh, that has happened over the last 500 years for black people attempting to preserve their humanity and safeguard their culture and their worldview. For those who are familiar with this movement, how many people have heard of the Black Radical School Tradition before? Not as new? Okay. How many people have heard of the Black Liberation Movement? All right, what about the Black Freedom Movement? Black Freedom Movement. All right, so let's talk about it in the context of the Black Freedom Movement. For those who have heard of the Black Freedom Movement, what is the Black Freedom Movement? Not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Slow down. Raise your hand. Why do you think that is distinct from the Black Liberation Movement? Well, I would argue that they. While they may not be the same exact thing, they have a connection with one another in the sense that they're attempting to challenge oppression, right? Systems that, that uh, house and foster oppressive conditions for people of African descent. Uh, you can try to think like Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King, Party. They're part of this black radical tradition too. So let me first state this. There have been a number of different groups that attempt to resist oppression, right? Now we all know that they're not, they do not all have the same ideological framework, right? They may not use the same tactics, if you will. They may not understand uh, oppression the same, but as it relates to the black radical tradition, they're all resisting something, if you will. And that oppression is that something. So their response to the oppression might be different, but yet they're still part of the same tradition in terms of resisting. And to make it more clear, there's two different figures in history that are largely uh, uh, compared with one another, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, for example, right? Two different ideological perspectives, two different approach, approaches as it relates to resistance, but yet they're still part of this same tradition in terms of resistance in and of itself. Does that make sense? It's the same thing in terms of Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois. Ideologically different, but still engaged in resistance. Still a part of this black radical tradition. Does that make sense? All right, so let's kind of try to define black radical tradition from your perspective. So I pose the question back to you all. Those who somewhat have an understanding of the black radical tradition or the freedom movement, what is this from your perspective? Okay. It's um, people who are exhibiting their uh, dislike of and unwillingness to continue being oppressed. Okay. And they want to make it known mm -hmm. that this oppression is morally and um, ethically uh, unfair. And it uh, is in direct opposition to the very laws and um, uh, things that this country claims to stand for. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to add on? Yes.
Various forms. Various forms of protest, right? Some are direct active uh, forms of protest, like taking to the street, uh, maybe marching, maybe demonstrating, right? Uh, there are more extreme forms in terms of destruction of property, right? And there's more passive forms as well, right? In terms of engaging in the construction of public policy, right? Uh, engaging in dialogues to enlighten people's thought about certain concepts, right? There's different forms of resistance. The point that I'm making is I'm not trying to look at one particular form. What I'm trying to define them all, uh, they are a part of this tradition in terms of resistance. Make sense? Yes. So you use the term radical. Yes. So do you see the people who run for office, like in the Democratic Party, the Black Caucus, etc., are they part of that as well? So the radical. Go ahead. Go ahead. What does radical mean? In this context versus, you know, because of different ideologies. Okay, so yes, it could be radical in regards to, again, a part of the attack on people of African descent is this whole notion that they have no humanity. And so within the face of this concept of having no humanity, it is radical to assert your humanity, right? And so by radical, radical doesn't necessarily mean engaging in destructive behavior as most people try to associate with radical. Right? It's challenging uh, something drastically, drastically different from the context in which people of African descent exist. So, asserting your humanity and engaging in the construction of intellectual thought, public policy, that's radical for a group of people that believe that you have no humanity and you shouldn't engage in certain activities as it relates to governing laws that govern our society, so on and so forth. Does that make sense? So to an extent, yes, it is radical, right? Um, however, I will, I will put an asterisk by it. <laughs> the fact that you are black and you run for public office doesn't necessarily make it radical at all. It, it depends on your action. So for example, if you're looking to engage in politics, but you're not looking to preserve the humanity of African people, it's not radical at all. It's simply another individual or another human being taking hold of elected office, if you will. So this black radical tradition, it mandates that you engage in the struggle of preserving the life, the humanity, the culture, and the worldview of people of African descent. Now, I keep using the, world, uh, the words culture and worldview. For me, when I use culture, I see culture as, think about it like our body, right? Our body has an immune system. What's the purpose of our immune system? It protects you and it fights off disease. That's what culture is. It's a design framework to be able to preserve your livelihood. It encompasses your customs, your rituals, your belief system, your value system, all of these different things and all of those different customs, values, is to preserve life as you understand it. Life as you understand it. Does that make sense? So when I mention culture, I mean it in that regard. It becomes the, uh, the immune system for a particular group to preserve life as they know it. Make sense? If not, then I can go back over it. <laughs> <laughs> worldview. What is worldview? I stated worldview is how you interpret the world and interact with the world, right? So let's talk about what I call African worldview. There are certain components that are associated with African worldview, right? There's characteristics that are unique to African people's worldview construct uh, when compared to, for example, European worldview. And I know I'm talking about it in a very uh, generalized fashion. I understand that African people exist throughout the world. Uh, they are very uh, uh, diverse. Um, that they don't exist in the same geographical space, so on and so forth. But what I will argue is there are black psychologists that have identified specific characteristics that are associated with people of African descent, whether they're in the US, on the continent, in the Caribbean, and uh, Europe, so on and so forth. So let's talk real quickly about these characteristics. I'll just pick out four. Well, hopefully you all will pick out four. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if I say African people's worldview, what do you all think should be involved 
for those who have observed people of African descent and feel like they can identify worldview characteristics of, of people of uh, African descent. And these things are distinct. We can see them even if we go to a black community today. We'll be able to see these things. I think so. I am. I can see them. But go ahead. It may seem trivial, but uh, dancing. Rhythm. Yeah. That's actually part of one of the components. Now, it's not just dancing. It's really a component of rhythm. Um, rhythm, yes, in the form of dancing, but that's more of a surface level component. Rhythm, uh, rhythm is very important in terms of uh, human to human relation. So, for example, for the African worldview construct, rhythm becomes important because, again, your relationship with other people dictates uh, your own stability to a certain extent. So, rhythm and dance. For African people, the drum creates a rhythm. That rhythm is supposed to be kind of the baseline to connect with other people. It's not simply just a rhythm just to have rhythm. So for example, during the period of enslavement, even in the most destitute periods of time, African people resorted to music. For what? Communication. Communication. What else did they use this rhythm for? Release. Release? Release? Solidarity. But, but, but also um, to bring them together. To bring them together. So for example, how many people have heard of work songs before? What's the function of a work song? To help get through the day. Help yeah. One of those components is to help work through the day, but it creates a rhythm. Think of a work song. It creates a rhythm so people can move on unison, right? That rhythm helps to create community. Community is one of the central components in terms of African people's worldview. And it starts with the rhythm, if you will, which is that dance, it, you know, it's, it, on the surface level it's represented in terms of dance, but it's also the lifeline, lifeline in terms of human to human connection. Does that make sense? Community. You can only have community if there's rhythm, right? If there is a connection, it's the drum that creates that rhythm and that connection, that interconnection between one person to the next. And that's why when you go, it might be generalized, y'all might attack me for it, but nonetheless, <laughs> when you go to Black Weddings, they have certain songs that they play, right? And it's group dances that they do. It used to be the electric side, something, now it's something else, right? But those group songs create that beat. It creates that unison to create community so that moves can be had at the same uh, kind of kick and the same baseline, so on and so forth, right? All right, what's another component in terms of after worldview which you all said? Creativity. Creativity. All right. Anybody else? One that's very central. Skin color? Not necessarily skin color. We come all skin tones under the sun. All right. So we got that one. Not quite. The idea that you are an ethnic group. I don't know. You're not white. Okay. Not quite. We're at one with nature. One with nature or spirituality. Spirituality is core for African people's worldview system. Very core. Actually, it's the central core in terms of African people's worldview. We view ourselves as spiritual beings, if you will. So I always ask this to my class. If I were to ask you what percentage of, of homes within a given black community in the United States are owned by those individuals, what percentage would you all say? What, what percentage of black homeowners, of the black population, what percentage of them are homeowners? This might be a Thomas question. You know this time? I'm not certain. I'm not certain on that one. I'm going to say somewhere around eight percent. Eight percent. Uh, what is Not that bad. It's not that bad. It's between. It's between like thirty and forty percent. All right, thirty and forty percent. All right. So, what percentage of the grocery stores in Black community do you think are owned and operated by Black folks? Ain't good. Right? All right, so what about the clothing manufacturing company for grocery stores? 
Oh, it's very low. Yeah. It's very low. Um, it, it's it's low. It's it's lower than ten percent here. Right. And certain communities, it's a little bit more, but uh, that, that percentage is by small, not large uh, chain grocery stores, but small mom and pop shops. Yeah. All right. For the food, um, I mean, for the clothing manufacturing companies, what percentage do you all think are owned and operated by? Back. Not many at all. Again, lower, lower than the one percent. All right, so let me let me pose this question: How many of the black churches do you all think are owned and operated by black community within the black community, owned and operated by the black churches? No, probably about seventy-five. It's higher than that. So why do I ask this question? What are the the, the, the components of survival as we know it in our society? Food, clothes, and shelter. Right? We don't house ourselves, we don't feed ourselves, we don't clothe, our, clothe ourselves, clothe ourselves, but we own our churches. Mm -hmm. What's the importance of that? We understand our lifeline for survival is our connection to God more than it is food, clothes, and shelter. And this becomes an indicator of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for African people, spirituality is very central, right? That's how we understand most fit for survival. In most African communities, what it means to be dead is not to physically perish. It's for those who have no spirit or those who have no connection with God, if you will. Right? So spirituality is one of those components that's very central for African world. And the other component is uh, high respect for elders, if you will. Right? And so when I'm talking about worldview or African worldview, I'm talking about these characteristics. This is how we understand the world to operate. To be spiritually connected in terms of a, a supreme being, to a certain extent, it doesn't mean that that supreme being needs to be called Jesus or Allah or the Damari. Whatever you call it, you know, that, that that's your business or that that's dictated by geographic location. But the core component is that there is a spiritual presence, if you will. All things comes from that spiritual presence. Now, again, it's not a general statement to say, you know, every single person of African descent is spiritual. It just says, in terms of African people understanding the world, spirituality is kind of the core component. Does that make sense? So when we're talking about African worldview, I'm speaking specifically to those characteristics. Um, and when I speak about culture, culture is supposed to safeguard those, those, those components. So, for example, the black church, and I'll run from this. Uh, why it is under this Christian faith, it's a radically different from other ethnic groups that engage in Christianity. So, for example, when you walk into the black church, it's not the same thing. Uh, you won't see the same thing, the same format as, as if you were to walk into a, a Protestant white church, if you will, right? To a certain extent, they alter it because, again, their understanding of the institution, it has a different function. Therefore, what you see will be drastically different. Y'all following me with this? All right. So when we're talking about preserving African people's culture and their worldview, it's preserving and safeguarding those sacred things of how we see it, it how we see it, it is important or vital for us in terms of survival. Make sense? All right. So going back to uh, contemporary demonstrations, when we're talking about the black radical tradition, we are talking about those activities that uh, help to safeguard against oppression. More specifically, when I define black radical tradition, I'm talking about thought and praxis that challenges systems and systems of thought that reinforce structural oppression for the purpose of maintaining black people's domination. And so by domination, I'm talking about ability to engage in cultural practice and ability to actually reinforce how they view the world and how they engage with the world. Now, domination can happen in the form of economics, politics, but more importantly, culture is important as well. <clears throat> If we look at some of the people who have engaged and tried to define with the Black Radical Tradition, Cedric Robinson, who wrote the uh, groundbreaking book, Black Marxism, uh, he talks about uh, 
committed to an internal critique of oppression, which means that this critique of oppression is amongst those people who are being oppressed and not outside in. Does that make sense? Meaning that people of African descent begin to uh, critique uh, oppression from within and not be informed or influenced by those who are not subjected to the same experience of uh, oppression. Is that clear? Yeah? Y'all sure? All right, and so for Cedric Robinson, he, goes, he said that it goes beyond just response to oppression. It actually moves into uh, a critique of the Western world and Western civilization in general, right? Becoming members that begin to engage in discussion about humanity, begins to engage in developing new systems that govern human behavior and interaction. Follow me so far? All right, so the thing is that I'm arguing is that professional black athletes that are engaging in protests, what they're doing is they're actually engaging in this black radical tradition that has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, Colin Kaepernick is not the first athlete that engaged in protests, right? And he won't be the last. There's currently uh, professional athletes that engage in protests, even though uh, Colin Kaepernick is not in the league anymore. And he hasn't been in the league for over a year, two years, really, right? With this one just finishing up. And so what does it mean in terms of professional black athletes? Why are they so important? And why is there a spotlight on professional black athletes that protest? First, let's talk about some of the professional athletes that have protested in the past. What are some of the ones that come to mind outside of Colin Kaepernick and uh, Reed and Lane and all of those who joined in on the protest with him? Ali. All right, so Muhammad Ali is one of the uh, professional athletes. And what did Muhammad Ali engage in? Or how did he protest? He went to jail and he refused to actually, uh, uh, he refused the draft, right, during the prime of his career, right? And he actually resulted by him going to jail, all right? Does it, and real quick enough before I get to you, do, does anybody remember his statement of why he refused to fight in the Vietnam War? You're killing people. You want me to kill people that look like me. All right. But there's some. There's another component after that. It was. It was the, one of the reasons why is because our, he utilized uh, his faith in terms of Islam um, as a means of not fighting an unjust war, right? He stated that uh, United States wanted him to go to Vietnam to be able to kill people that look just like him. In the last part of that statement, when you are not treating me just here, I can't get the same treatment here. And you're asking me to go fight to be able to extend your concept of democracy when I can't get democracy here. What does that look like, right? So there's a contradiction that he, he points out. You want me to expand your notion of democracy and I can't get democracy. What does that look like? All right, so that's one demonstration. Well, I'm not sure now. I was gonna say Paul Robeson. I got Paul Robeson on there. Uh, How did Paul Robeson, uh, Demonstrate a protest in 1950. 1950. Yes, in 1950, he refused to sign an affidavit uh, denouncing the uh, Communist Party. Right at the height of the Red, the uh, the Cold War, as, as they say. Right. He refused to denounce communism. What's the importance of that? Lost his career. He lost his career, right? He actually uh, couldn't get back into the United States during the prime of his career, right? By the time he got back to the United States, his fame, uh, his fortune to a certain extent had diminished, right? In terms of him getting back into his theatrical career, he could no longer perform in the same houses and get the same amount of money as he did, right? His name was slandered. Right? But what's the importance in terms of him not denouncing uh, the Communist Party? Or what's his gripe with the, I mean, with, with, with capitalism, if you will? 
Well, I, to me, it was like, um, I'm, that, you know, I'm not going to let anybody turn me around because this is who I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to let you make me something I'm not. Okay. It's just, the whole Carthyism was just part of a witch hunt. It was a certain set of standards and values that they claimed to have, and if you didn't have that, you were a communist. Okay, and definitely he, that. He refused to name, he refused to name people or state which side he was on, because that was unmerited. I mean, his values didn't allow him to do that. Okay, okay. Is there another reason that you all can see why it becomes problematic for him not denouncing uh, communism? Well, it was viewed as the opposite of capitalism. And, uh, and also at the time, Russia was like, was our enemy. Mm -hmm. So how could you know anyone who was a patriotic American become a communist? Definitely. During, uh, between the 1930s and the 1950s, uh, after Americans joined in the Communist Party, grew in numbers, uh, large numbers, if you will. And so during the Cold War, African Americans actually leaving the United States, going uh, abroad to be able to engage this concept of communism grew. And so Paul Robeson during this period of time, being not, he wasn't an athlete during this time, but he was a successful uh, theatrical actor as well as a singer, right? Which advances just the numbers of blacks joining the Communist Party a little bit more, right? Why? Why him? Because he wasn't the only black individual joining the Communist Party or not denouncing the Communist Party at the time. So why is it important to persecute him individually? Because he had a voice, he had a stature, he had an elevation in the community, just like the athletes today and, and before. Those people have a larger voice. Definitely, right? And I'll talk about this later. Athletes and entertainers have the ability to transform a discourse to an inter international conversation just like that, right? So when we talk about professional athletes, yes, they are domestic athletes, but they had an international stage. And so when they begin to engage in different discourse around issues, it broadens the conversation to, from a domestic conversation to an international conversation. Does that make sense? Right? And so it, it doesn't just become a domestic issue, it becomes an international conversation where you allow others to be able to engage on issues that are happening in the United States. And it doesn't help itself that the U.S. attempts to position itself as the leader of uh, the world, if you will not only in terms of economics and the political system, but also in the moral ethics, in terms of concepts such as democracy, so on and so forth, right? And so turning it into an international conversation, it exposes contradictions uh, within our nation as it relates to issues around race, economics, and even politics, if you will. So y'all follow me so far? So, yes, Paul Robeson. Any other ones that you all can think of? Arthur Ashe. Arthur Ashe? Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Arthur Ashe and then we'll come back. We'll come back to Tommy Smith and uh, uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. So Arthur Ashe, how many people are familiar with Arthur Ashe engaging in uh, uh, demonstrations and protests? Okay, okay. What did Arthur Ashe advocate for? Well, he wouldn't play tennis in certain places. Right. South Africa more specifically. So one of the things that he protested against was apartheid in South, in South Africa, right? Which was a big issue in the 80s, uh, in the 80s and 90s, if you will. Well, it was a big issue for, you know, far longer than that. But in terms of U.S. engaging in a discourse, in terms of people demonstrating in the U.S., attempting to uh, have the U.S. Uh, part ways with those uh, who were in power in South Africa, uh, apartheid in South Africa. Does that make sense? All right. So one of the things that he advocated for was against apartheid South Africa. Um, yes, it did impact him specifically in terms of he was uh, prohibited from playing in South Africa. 
but also he's seen the impact of the system of apartheid itself. What else did he advocate for? He actually advocated for a couple of things. So South Africa was one of them. There was another thing that he advocated for. It was, uh, it was um, the immigration policy, which is actually some of the, one of the issues that we're dealing with now, right? It was immigration <laughs> issues, specifically those who live in um, Haiti, right? Dealing with the Haiti refugees that came here in the 90s, right? And they talked about uh, the policy, U.S. policy on immigration, specifically those who were in Haiti, and just black nations in general, right? So we begin to engage on how the U.S. deals with foreign communities that are primarily black and brown to a certain extent, right? Recognizing them as being refugees, or not refugees, and others as refugees, right? The whole color line that plays a role in terms of the politics in the U.S., Make sense? Yeah. All right. And so Tommy Smith and uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, what are some of the things that they did in terms of engaging in protests? I want to go back to my branch. Okay, yes. Um, would it be considered a black radical tradition if you started on the Arthur Ashe Foundation? Say that one more time. You started on Arthur Ashe Foundation where you where you did positive things for the for black people. In the community against um, things that weren't there before, you know, um, for kids, learning things, and things like that. Um, I think that it's it's part of the Black Radical tradition in that it seeks to <clears throat> advance his interest in terms of again the anti or the apartheid South Africa, but also his discussion around immigration, specifically geared toward. Uh, the Haitian community and those who were Haitian uh, refugees, if you will, right? You engaging or contributing to those things is advancing his legacy of protesting uh, systems of oppression that are directed toward people of African descent. Yes. So it's only on, on protesting oppression. It's not um, protesting oppression by building up power in the black community. Well, that's one of the components. If you're utilizing that power again to safeguard or to dismantle systems that seek to uh, dominate or uh, marginalize people of African descent, then yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is his foundation seeks to advance his legacy, right? And by way of advancing his legacy, you're engaging in the black radical tradition. Does that make sense? Now, at any point that that, that uh, you know, whatever it is that's created is not advancing the legacy, then it's, it's a matter of question, right? Uh, what are your contributions going toward and what are the activities that are coming out of it, if you will? The Arthur Ashe uh, Foundation is seeking to advance his legacy and his legacy was one that was rooted in uh, protesting ill treatment of people, not only people of African descent, but uh, ill treatment of humans in general. Um, a lot of his demonstrations specifically were geared toward people of African descent, but again, that foundation was geared toward advancing the legacy. All right? John Carlos, Tommy Smith, let's talk about their, uh, their demonstrations, right? The 68 Olympics, Summer Olympics. Right in the middle of the Black Power Movement. Right in the middle of the Black Power Movement, if you will. Right? So what happens there? What happens during the demonstration uh, carried out by uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos? Oh, so I have a, a world stage. You have a world stage, again, here it is again, where you have an athlete that has the ability to transform a discussion from a domestic issue to an international issue, if you will, and right? You know, your protest is right in the middle of the national anthem. It's during the national anthem, just like uh, Kaepernick, as we talked about earlier. Well, prior, prior to their demonstration, black athletes got together, uh, they tried to come together on how they were going to demonstrate, but then they, they broke, they fragmented 
Some chose to go, some chose, like uh, Kareem chose not to go. So after that, they said, well, we're going to do something. So you could, you have uh, your own free will as to how you, you choose to demonstrate mm -hmm. against uh, this uh, oppressive uh, system that we have. Okay, okay. So one of the things that happened during the, the Summer Olympics of 68 was John Carlos and, and Tommy Smith uh, demonstrated during the national anthem in which both of them, uh, uh, there's a number of things that they did. And there was a number of different symbols that represented what they did. Um, if you ask them today, they will tell you it was a humanist uh, demonstration, right? Uh, one of the things that they had was a black glove on, on uh, their right hand, right? One of the things that they did was with the clenched fist during the national anthem, they raised their head, they bowed their, I mean, they raised their arms, bowed their head, closed their eyes, right? Uh, Tommy Smith uh, didn't have his shoes on. In fact, uh, he took his shoes off and they were on the platform next to him, which symbolizes uh, the poverty that people of African descent, as well as uh, those uh, of Hispanic descent were experiencing. Right? Uh, he had a case in his hand that represented the humanity in terms of uh, people throughout the world, right? As well as he had a necklace around his neck that illustrated uh, connection amongst people throughout the world uh, that they should also have the interest in terms of preserving not only people of African descent humanity, but humanity just in general, right? So let's briefly talk about what happened to Tommy Smith and John Carlos after the Olympics. They were ostracized. They were ostracized. So Anything else? Sent home. They were sent home. Their medals were stripped. They were stripped right. of their medals. I, I think they were generally um, uh, ruined by the, by the um, Olympic Committee. Yeah. Because they were ruined. And personally, they were set up as targets for people. Exactly. Right? They were isolated, ostracized, right? Uh, they couldn't find work for years. Uh, in terms of, uh, well, they weren't political, uh, elected uh, politicians at all, but in terms of the image that was carried on them for years, uh, they were hands off, is what I would call, in terms of untouchable, right? For a long period of time. So we talked about a number of people who engage, who have engaged in this protest. Um, and while we only talked about the backlash of Tommy Smith and John Carlos, we can look at a number of these different athletes and talk about the impact or the response in terms of their protests. So we talked about John, um, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Uh, we talked a little bit about Muhammad Ali and what happened to Muhammad Ali. Yes, he was in prison. But the most important thing uh, about Muhammad Ali is he was in prison during the height of his career, right? He was in prison during the height of his career. He was unable to box for three years, which is crucial in sports. Anybody who plays sports, three years is kind of like an eternity to a certain extent, especially um, in areas of boxing and, and, and very, uh, con very heavy contact sports, if you will, right? Even when he came back to boxing, he looked vastly different. Even in terms of his body makeup, he was different. He actually had to revolution, re revolutionize and change his whole boxing style. I don't know if you all uh, were able to look at his physique prior to him being uh, in prison and after him being uh, in prison. Before, it was, uh, before he was in prison, he used to have this saying, float like a, uh, wait, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. After he was in prison, he was not floating. And <laughs> he was still stinging people, but the floating thing was not there, right? He was the rope dope right? Which means with the rope dope he was taking on punches heavily, if you will, right? And so this impacted his career very heavily. He actually had to revolutionize the way that he fights, the way that he fought, if you will. Um, another thing that was important in terms of Muhammad Ali, he was ostracized, right? If you look at uh, the money impact that he had, had on him economically, if you look at the impact that it had on his image as a fighter, 
Uh, while he was one that was able to re, uh, bounce back and recover in terms of the attack and change over quite quickly, like we know about uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos now, this is more than 50 years later, Muhammad Ali was one of the ones that were, was able to recover very quickly. Uh, he was able to recover within 10 years, shorter than 10 years. Some would say almost uh, five years. Most athletes that are targeted in that fashion are not able to, to recover that fast, if you will. Yes? I, just, I think that, that partially he was able to recover. I think partially. as a result of what he did, there were people that continued to hate him mm -hmm. what he did throughout his life. So to say recover, he was able to regain the ability to box, and there were still people who admired him. But but I think throughout his, his lifetime, as a result of what he did, he was um, he was hated by a lot of people. Yes, yes, and but I would say that he became even more popular than he would have been. Right, right, and that's that's what I mean by recovering. And, and so let me let me kind of create a context by recovery. So one of the components in terms of the way that he was able to recover was, yes, he was able to box again, right? He was able to recover in terms of economic ability to be able to make money, if you will. But also in terms of recovery is he was able to regain the mic in terms of interviews, right? Yeah. right? In terms of being able to uh, be on national television and be able to share his side of the story, right? Most athletes don't. Think about how many interviews you saw with Tommy Smith and uh, John Carlos after the demonstration. Of course, I wasn't alive. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did research this. While there were some outlet sources that did interview them, they did not have a national stage or an international stage to be able to share their side of the story, right? I wouldn't be surprised if there are some of you all uh, this is your first time hearing about the shoes being on, uh, off and faced backwards and the necklace, right? It's because it didn't become largely a part of the narrative. If you don't research these things, you wouldn't know it simply because they did not have the mic to be able to express themselves. And so Muhammad Ali was able to maintain the mic to be able to speak and create a new narrative to challenge that narrative that critiqued his decision not to go to war. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say that track athletes during that period of time were not professional athletes mm -hmm. such as Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. And okay. so to step out there in that manner, it really impacted them more, I believe, mean, economically, because any um, economic benefit to being successful with track was through sponsorship, United mm -hmm. endorsement. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there wasn't the stage. Mm -hmm. And that's with, with sports such as that, where Olympics becomes kind of the apex of, of, of the career, that's one of the things. There's no national organization like the NBA, NFL, where there's ongoing events that are happening and you're competing with people. Now, there are games that happen throughout the year, but it's not to the same level as leagues that have uh, specific seasons in which they, they compete. The other thing I'll point to is that Ali operated on his own, meaning that he was in an individualized sport, so he controlled his own destiny. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you play on a team where you have a lead right. and you right. shut you out, yeah. or you know you have teammates that would not play with you, or there's a bunch of other factors, he controlled his own destiny, he could pick what fights he wanted, he oh. had some modicum of control because there were these you know, the governing body, so to speak. And he didn't have the same issue as a Joe Lewis, so to speak. Exactly. And I think with the, the uh, Boxing Commission, it was just as beneficial for them as it was yeah. for Muhammad Ali to allow him to fight. Yeah. Because yeah. him fighting would generate more money yeah. for the yeah. league. Um, unlike a Colin Kaepernick, you have 32 teams. And of the 32 teams, you might have over 90 quarterbacks within the league, if you will, right? And who needs a Colin Kaepernick when I can have a whoever else, if that makes sense? Whereas with Muhammad Ali, it's a different discussion, right? You actually claim will benefit me in terms of generating revenue uh, more than not letting you fight. Does the media when Tommy came to, to 
Yes. Yes. He's allowed to suffer. But on any of that, your focus was because they only have a few things to work with. Mm -hmm. One was one pair of gloves, one with a right hand, one with a left. And yeah. that was it. Same thing about the reason why Ali came back faster because of the money. Definitely. Definitely. But I, I, I will say that him generating uh, kind of a national appeal to fight. One, it was it was Frazier, but two, he had the mic to create this this climate of this would be the best fight ever, and you want to see it, right? And so he created this whole national appeal or move toward this large prize fight um, that would generate that much money, if you will. But again, if not having the mic, you know his 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 character or his uh, his pizzazz. Well, uh, I think he was largely responsible for creating that kind of push. He promoted it. Yeah. And he had, unlike a lot of other athletes, he had a world stage. So the pressure that was put on him in the United States uh, was overwrought by world pressure, which he had to support around the world and, and, and a whole bunch of other countries. So the U.S. couldn't really just push him aside like they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. I, yes, ma'am. And what somebody saying is that he had a strong community behind him. Mm -hmm. So he had a strong community behind him. Uh, he had the support of the NOI, uh, the NOI, as well as the black community in general. Uh, this happened in '67, right? And part of that community was other professional athletes as well, right? So we talk about the summit that actually happened amongst black athletes in uh, Cleveland, in which black athletes came to his support. Uh, people like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right? Uh, Jim Brown, uh, Bill Russell. There was a number of black athletes that actually stood with him. Uh, funny enough, if you read about the summit, actually part of it is that they went in there to, to persuade them not <laughs> to dodge, if you will. But nonetheless, they came out in stance and in unison with him to be able to support him as black, black athletes. Um, so one of the things that's important for us is to make sense of the critique and also what happens to these black athletes after they protest. So we talk about the devastation of careers of Muhammad Ali, Tommy Smith, uh, Juan, uh, John Carlos, Arthur Ashe, uh, he was toward the end of his career. So um, in fact, much of what he did was after he retired. So in terms of impacting his career, his ability to be able to maintain himself as a professional athlete is a little different. Uh, Paul Robeson, he was an athlete, but during the time of his protest, he wasn't an athlete. We can put him in the athlete context, uh, context because he was a professional football player at one point in time. But we can see the impact of his career was completely devastated um, moving into the Cold War and moving out of the Cold War. By the time he gets back to the U.S., his career is pretty much over, right? He's pretty much done with in terms of performing um, in certain uh, theaters, singing, so on and so forth. And so we look at the devastation and the isolation of these different events, right? Uh, did you have your hands up? I'm sorry. Who do you consider Kurt Flood? He was blackballed in baseball um, because of his stance on free agency, which was, which was bringing the whole thing to the right. Of money. And, and the name, I'm sorry, I didn't hear Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood. He chose, he said, free I want to be paid. Uh, same as all these other top guys, and they said no, so he, he refused and set out, and uh, he, he actually changed the rule that they had. So now you could be a free agent. At that point, you could not be a free agent. A team owned you for perpetuity, really. They can treat you as whatever. Yeah. It was like, you know, it's like slavery. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting, yeah. Uh -huh. um, just an interjection. Where would you place the Williams sisters in this? And I know that a lot of the things that they did um, benefited women in sports, mm -hmm. but it also, you know, they protested the, the 
the tournament in Indian Wells for years because of the way they were treated. I mean, so where would you place them in this? In this so I think that they, they, they do engage the black radical tradition. Um, while it, not, it may not be to the same degree as, as, as the names that we've talked about, I think they, they do engage it because they press back against these racial codes that exist uh, in these unwritten rules and treatment in terms of athletes. And if you look at the, the Williams sisters, uh, while they're able to excel in their sport um, and be successful, the way that they're dealt with in terms of the media, the analyzing, the way that they play, the seats, all of those different things, that's part of the reason why they push back. Mm -hmm. And so they do push back to be able to preserve their humanity to a certain extent. And so in that regard, they do fall within this black radical tradition because again, they're attempting to preserve African people's humanity by way of preserving their own humanity. To say, man, I am a human being and I have the ability to define who I am how I'm to uh, perform, what I am to wear, what, am I, what I am to look like when I walk out on the court and say, like, it's my decision, it's not yours. And so in that regard, that's the part of that pushback, uh, to preserve their humanity in that regard. Yeah. Go ahead. Jack Johnson. Um, yeah. 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 Jack, Jack Johnson, yes, yes, you know. Because <laughs> Jack Johnson, he did resist. It's just the whole matter of what are you resisting and, you know, type thing. But I will say this. With all of these different things, we, we, what we have to understand is black people's existence in this country is very complex. And so for Jack Johnson, you know, everybody familiar with Jack Johnson? First black uh, heavyweight champion. Of the world, right? One of the things that he fought, of, fought for is his ability to be able to date and marry white women if he chose to do so, right? Um, one of the things, right? That was one of the main things that he got in trouble for, right? That's one of the main things that he was critiqued for, right? And so some of us might say, well, what is that the fight for, right? Or why does that become significant or associated with the black radical tradition? What I will state is, it is part of resisting in the sense of, again, I am human being. And who's to say who I can date and marry and who can I, who's to say that I'm not able to do so? And so again, this whole personal choice and having the ability to be able to determine your own destiny, how you see fit, does become a part of that to say, I am human in this world, right? And this is part of preserving my humanity to a certain extent, right? And so at the beginning, I said that, you know, this resistance, it happens in a number of different shapes and, 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 and it carries itself out in, in a number of different ways. Jack Johnson would be one of those ways where, yes, I am pushing back, but what I'm pushing back for may not be at the core of this whole concept of the black radical tradition. But nonetheless, it is this whole notion to say, man, I'm a human being and I can choose what I want to choose, right? And the color of my skin should not be a dictator a dictating factor to say, this is not part of your choice. If you will. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna come here in a minute. So as it relates to the Williams sisters, I think that it's even more complex because they create issues of gender equality, mm -hmm. um, more so than even just being black, but, but that distinction. Mm -hmm. they, they do gender equality, but even racial equality. So even if you look at uh, recently, Serena, uh, it was more a couple of years ago talking about pay amongst uh, women uh, tennis players. And uh, one who hadn't, she was the highest take, uh, paid tennis player during this period of time, I want to say two years ago, uh, but hadn't won many uh, titles at all. But in regards to endorsements, uh, and things such as that, she was the highest paid tennis player. And so even within the ranks of women or amongst women, uh, her receiving lower pay while being the number number one ranked tennis, uh, female tennis uh, player in, in the world, uh, she engaged that in terms of equal pay, as well as equal pay amongst gender as well. Okay. I was just gonna ask whether you thought Joe Lewis fit within the black radical tradition in the sense that he was using a different path to get back to the title, so to speak, because he's almost seeing a antithesis of 
speaking out, you know, because he had to be something different in order to get a shot at the press. Yeah. So I, I, I think this, with this black radical tradition, it, it's not a, a boot camp to say, all right, all right, these people are a part and these people are not. The thing is, is, is the black experience here in the U.S. is very complex. And part of it is it's wrapped around this experience of racism. And so with people of African descent engaging our society and have to navigate the spaces that we, uh, that we uh, occupy, navigating also racism and perceptions about us that are based and rooted in race makes us a part of this, this, this black radical tradition. And because part of his experience is largely influenced by his color, right? Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson, uh, Lewis, uh, the Williams sister, being a part of this experience automatic, automatically forces you to a certain extent to push back, to say, my race is not a determining factor. Uh, shouldn't be a determining factor of my treatment from society as well as those that are in my profession. If you will. My pay shouldn't be dictated. My access to fight for a uh, title shouldn't uh, be uh, dictated by my race. My access to lead roles in terms of movies, right? My access of being a quarterback in the NFL or so on. All of these things are very complex because the racial component is, is, is very subtle, but it's very upfront um, and it's very front and center uh, as it relates to black people's interaction with society and <clears throat> different institutions that kind of govern, provides opportunities and excludes people from opportunities, if you will, right? So one more so question there. One more person that is Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson. Yeah. Definitely one. Yeah. But he had to face a lot of racism. Just his ability to get through that. Definitely. And just, just his ability to get through all the racism that he had to go through was actually a protest in itself. Yeah, yeah. the fact that him stepping on the stage makes him kind of an icon. Not necessarily an icon, I want to say. But makes him a, uh, a figure for the black radical tradition. Again, this tradition is just a pushback to say, man, we're preserving black people's humanity. And that preservation could happen to say like, man, our presence here in the National Baseball League, uh, or yeah, the major baseball league, I'm sorry, should be an opportunity for us. And, and yes, he did endure a lot in terms of his, his, his experience um, and dealing with it, and also the demand on his response, because it's not simply what he did, but also, you know, this whole notion of being or acting in a certain manner so that society uh, could reflect on our humanity and, and recognize our humanity. So, for example, with Jackie Robinson, it was a man, if you're, if you're confronted with racial attacks, Understand that your response to those attacks need to be very subtle and indirect, if you will, right? And so, again, going back to what I stated, different approaches and ideological uh, perspectives on these things are different. For Jackie Robinson, it was a more subtle and direct, you know, as it related to being on the baseball field, in the media, his responses to media. However, in the backdrop, he organized, right? Uh, he developed support groups for other athletes that came into the major. That's, that's that component of the black uh, radical tradition that he really engages in, right? Mentors, players, so on and so forth, right? Don't, that's that indirect, behind the scenes activity that he engages in. Now, when we talk about the, uh, the critique in terms of these black athletes, and what happens uh, to these black athletes to make them examples of what it looks like if you resist or when you resist becomes very important. One of the things that I've used as a framework to kind of frame these critiques is I use a theory by uh, Michael Tillerson called agency reduction formation, right? And essentially what he states is 
there are different forms of thought that attempt to neutralize people of African descent's resistance to oppressive systems, right? And so he defines agency reduction as a system of thought that distracts, neutralizes, or reduces the need and desire for asserting collective agency by African Americans, right? And so essentially, what I'm getting at is what happens to professional black athletes that have resisted historically, that have engaged in this black radical tradition, uh, we talked about them being ostracized, isolated. Uh, many of their professional careers have been stunted. Uh, of course, this is more along uh, the lines of those who are resisting during the 60s, 70s. We can look at Kaepernick, but different forms of resistance, kind of like the Williams sisters, um, and other athletes are not so much because it's a different, a different sport. But essentially what I'm arguing here is the way that these athletes are treated, what they're attempting to do is to break the will of these athletes uh, from resisting and using their platform uh, to engage in this black radical tradition. And so this persuasion is what Michael Tillerson calls agency reduction. And essentially, it's attempting to remove the agency of the athletes, right? Your agency is your ability uh, to have the power to be able to engage, actively engage in protest, actively engage in uh, speaking up for yourself, so on and so forth. And so the critiques of these athletes uh, attempts to remove the agency from the athlete itself, right? Um, I further explain agency reduction as a destabilizing system that weakens a group or individual's ability to combat behaviors that are socially, politically, economically, and intellectually harmful for the survival of that group or individual. Right? So shut up and, dri and dribble. <laughs> shut up and dribble. You are an athlete. You were supposed to entertain. Entertain. Right? Uh, so that agency reduction attempts to persuade people to shut up and dribble, right? If you will. Or shut up and box. And if we tell you to go to war, shut up and fight. Right? If you are a quarterback, shut up and play. Right? Remove the agency from the individual. But this is very harmful, the agency reduction, or this attempt to remove the agency from professional athletes. Right? Why is this harmful? Or why do you all think it's harmful? I believe it's harmful. Why do you all think it's harmful? Given that you accept my premise. <laughs> I think it's because I'm happy. Some athletes are more strong than others. So when you talk about LeBron James, Shut and Dribble, I love his five back. He might not be like a Michael Jordan or something like that. Yeah. And I think that professional athletes are, are the context that Professional athletes existed now is not the same context that they existed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, right? Some of these athletes are moguls within their own right now. And so while, yes, they play professional basketball, in all actuality, they get paid more by their endorsements than they do by the league. Right. To, to, so to a certain extent, they have a level of self-sufficiency to not necessarily depend on the league. And even to a point, they have a little bit more power to persuade the league to do stuff more than the league has persuasion on them to do things, if that makes sense. And leagues such as the NBA. NFL is a different game, right? And I was going to say, their agency is also their own personal agency that you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Determines whether or not they can be totally removed from mm -hmm. their, their, their seat of, of having any agency at all. Definitely. Definitely. All right. So agency reduction, why does it become harmful? Because um, others see these actions as role models. And so if it impacts those that are considered elite on the, on the world stage, why should I do anything to um, jeopardize my standing? Yeah, they're going to experience that, and it's going to cause them to be treated. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, for example, the persecution of those athletes, 
that actually persuaded others not to engage in protest to a certain extent. And on the other end of that, to that token, those that do protest, it encourages protest. It encourages that creativity to engage in protest. So somebody brought up LeBron James. LeBron James has engaged in protest in very creative ways, right? Um, I'm not going to gauge how effective it is or how not effective it is, but I will say that he has had the power to be able to engage in some forms of protest to at least say, I stand with uh, those who are advocating for, uh, uh, for communities that are advocating for fair treatment in terms of the criminal justice system, for example, right? All right. So I, somebody else had their hand up. Somebody All right, um, yes. Okay, if we can reaffirm. Um, with the with society as a whole, more or less that you're supposed to stay in your place. And it also, so that if you stay in your place, you're not going to have any disruption and everything is okay because everybody is where they're supposed to be. Exactly. And what is what is your place? Not your place, but <laughs> if that person stay in your place, what does that mean? Powers. To not speak out, not stand up, uh, when you see patients, ignore them. Okay, so what are you doing? If you're not doing those things, speaking out, standing up, all that, what is it that you're doing? Like, what is your place? What is your role? Entertain. Entertain. You are a unit of, unit of labor, as stated before. Let's not misunderstand this. People of African descent that were transported, uh, that were uh, yeah. transported from the continent to the United States, specifically Northern America, what were they transported for? Labor. Labor. Units of labor to produce product, to generate what? Wealth. Wealth and capital. Shut up and dribble. Your role and your responsibility is to act and perform as a unit of labor. And the minute be, uh, that you begin to engage in other things such as politics, economics, so on and so forth, you are moving outside of your place, if you will, right? So it's important for us to understand the agency production is for a purpose, specifically to maintain a status quo, which means that, again, you remain powerless, but you continue to be a unit of labor to a certain extent. Follow me? Uh, yes. Has Tillotson considered his, his work, he keeps his work um, geared towards African Americans because I'm asking, because if you look at the second point, that's true of like all oppressed groups inside the United States. Yeah, so his, his particular uh, theory is geared toward African Americans. Uh, the second point is my asserting and, and expanding it a little bit better, uh, a little bit more, right? But essentially, it, it means the same thing, but it can be applied to anybody. But his, his theory is here specifically for that. Right? All right. So for the purpose of this research agency or this presentation, agency reduction formation refers to ideological frameworks that discourage African Americans from using protests, and or revolt as a tool for resisting domination. And so, while you might look at a Muhammad Ali and say, well, Muhammad Ali is not dominated, right? If you look at Colin Kaepernick, you might say, well, Colin Kaepernick is not dominated. You know, he's a free individual. He's walking around, so on and so forth, right? When I'm talking about domination, we're talking about, again, communities. What was uh, Colin Kaepernick advocating for? Muhammad Ali, John Carlos, all of these different individuals were advocating for African-American communities that are being treated unjustly. While Colin Kaepernick was uh, specifically talking about law and criminal justice system, these other athletes are pointing at different aspects of the community and the way in which ill treatment uh, is being brought on these particular communities. And so when we talk about domination, we're talking about communities that are uh, being repressed to a certain extent, right? To limit their ability to be uh, agents. Um, and specifically toward uh, professional athletes, they're being persuaded not to advocate for these particular groups. Y'all follow me so far? All right. And so 
I'm going to go through uh, real quick. One of the things that I did was I looked at the Colin Kaepernick uh, responses to uh, Colin Kaepernick engaging in protests. And one of the things that I did is I, I viewed the various uh, commentators or commentation about this particular protest, and I developed different narratives that were based are that came out of the discussion on these protests. And there's two types of narratives that I developed. I developed the dominant narrative, looking at the, the core principles or the core uh, points that were coming out, and then I developed a counter narrative. And so I'll talk about these narratives real quick, and then we'll move into the discussion. So the dominant narrative is defined as narratives constructed from a perspective and, uh, a perspective and or lived experience of the dominant, uh, dominant cultural group of society, right? Which is largely white patriarchal uh, perspective. So essentially, uh, uh, white men, if you will, okay? It's an experience that uh, moves out of the experience of white men of this given society, right? In most cases, dominant narratives consist of accepted cultural norms that are informed by stories rooted in the experiences of the dominant cultural group. So from uh, looking at the commentation of uh, those that are around the Kaepernick uh, demonstration, there were key things that were pulled out. And by looking at the discussions, I looked at uh, media outlet source, even political commentators that uh, weighed in on the discussion, as well as the athletes themselves. So when I'm analyzing the theme for the dominant narrative, uh, there are three key themes that came out around responses to the demonstration itself, right? Uh, one of the responses was professional athletes demonstrating during the national anthem, American national anthem, uh, undermines the work of servicemen and women of the United States military and law enforcement. Uh, uh, law enforcement, I'm sorry. That was one of the things. The next thing was professional athletes engaging in protests, engaging in disruptive behavior and challenges team, uh, team camaraderie. Right? The last thing that I was able to uh, pull from the different commentary was that uh, protests during the national anthem uh, is engaging in unpatriotic or disrespectful behavior. Right? Those who have kind of looked at the discourse around professional athletes engaging in protests. Did you all kind of somewhat get these things? Or can you see where I pulled these things from? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, all right. So the counter narrative, counter narrative or construction narratives that uh, conflict or challenge dominant narratives. Counter narratives are often used by a context of rejecting accepted norms of the dominant narratives. In addition, counter narratives attempt to centralize narratives of cultural groups that exist on the margins of society and whose experiences contradict uh, the dominant narrative. So, in this regard, the counter narrative would be those who were engaging in protest or those who supported protest, if you will. So, the themes that came out uh, in terms of the counter narratives. The first thing that I uh, pulled out was the killing of unarmed African-American men, women, and children by law enforcement is an act of injustice and, and, is a, and is rooted in a historical practice of racism in the United States. The second thing that I was able to pull out in terms of the comments were the treatment of the killing of African-American men, women, and children by law enforcement and the criminal justice system undermines the principles and values that embody that are embodied uh, in the American National Anthem, celebration of freedom for all, if you will, right? The last thing that I was able to pull back, pull out was law enforcement and the criminal justice system are not holding those, uh, not holding those who uh, commit these crimes accountable. And uh, them not being held accountable is an unjust act against African Americans. So essentially what I did is looked at all the interviews look at all the transcriptions in terms of those who are weighing in on Colin Kaepernick and uh, the protest, and I was able to extract themes that were pulled out from those who were commenting on these themes, right? And those are the six themes that I was able to pull out. 
essentially, uh, one of the things that's important, and I stated this earlier, if you look at Colin Kaepernick by itself, even if you look at all of the professional athletes that we talked about today by themselves, we will take them out of context. Yes, they are athletes, but their protest falls into a fold of a historical context in which people of African descent or marginalized people in general have engaged in to preserve their own humanity, which means that you can only understand Colin Kaepernick if you place them within a historical context of this black radical tradition, right? Also, that these demonstration loses its, its legitimacy when disconnected to the black radical tradition, which is what I just stated, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the context that we have to understand is that these athletes are a part of the African American community, right? And these protests are linked to historical traditions or historical events that African Americans have engaged in since being enslaved to a certain extent, right? And even before that point, but within the American context, since enslavement, right? And many of uh, the conditions that we live in are under the same context of those during the period of enslavement. And so if you want to understand the professional athletes and their protests, you have to understand the context of the African-American community historically. Make sense? Once you begin to pull them away and say that they're only athletes or they have money and they should not, uh, they have no reason to protest, what you've done is taken them out of their historical context and you've isolated them, which means that you delegitimize uh, their act in and of itself. Follow me? All right. So lastly, well, we talked about these in terms of the historical context. This is the historical context. I have Paul Robeson on there, Muhammad Ali, John Carlos, Tommy Smith, Arthur Ashe. Now, we know that there's a host of other athletes. This is just an example to say that the current form of uh, protest is not new. It's old. And if I were to put different movements that are organized and carried out by people back in the same in the U.S., it would be even more. But the only point that I'm trying to prove is it's a part of the tradition, right? And this tradition can only be understood within a historical context. They don't happen uh, isolated, um, and it can be understood isolated by themselves. So what's the significance in terms of professional athletes protest? And this is the last slide we can go into Q&A it's, as I stated before, it, created, it, it creates an international discourse on the issue, <laughs> right? Um, it moves from a domestic discussion to an international discussion. Tommy Smith, John Carlos, international stage, a world stage. Same thing with any professional uh, sports event. It creates an international venue to be able to engage in domestic issues. The other thing is uncensored analysis. Professional athletes have a media mandate, right? They have to make themselves available to the media uh, after either a performance or during media days, right? And so this uncensored analysis means that I have the ability to be able to say what I want to say uncensored, right? And uninfluenced, if you will, right? And so the threat or the significance of professional athletes it's one of these situations where they have a world mic and they have the ability to say whatever they want to say without being uh, coached first, if you will. Does that make sense? And it's a mandate. It's a part of their contract. And so in most cases, when, when, when athletes engage in protest, right after the game and right after the event, what happens? Everybody wants to ask why. Why did you do that? Why did you wear that shirt? Why are you kneeling? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? It reminds you it's right after the game. So there's, you know, in most cases you would be, there's no owner coming down and say, this is your statement that you're supposed to uh, read to explain why you engaged in this behavior. So this uncensored analysis gives professional athletes to be able to uncensor themselves and say whatever it is that they want to say um, to be able to articulate themselves. If you all have not uh, listened to Colin Kaepernick's explanation of why he engaged in protest, 
This speaks to that. It's uncensored, it's very direct, and it's very explicit in terms of his rationale and the purpose, right? And it wasn't a written statement, right? And it wasn't informed by ownership. I can guarantee you that, right? All right, and so the last component is the stature of these athletes. One of the things that our society does is it blows entertainers up. It blows their stature up in terms of who they are, um, as well as what they're supposed to represent. So for example, LeBron James is not simply a basketball player. To some people, he's like a demigod, right? Maybe not to us in this room. But if you look at youth, and some that may look at professional athletes as something uh, that's beyond human, again, it creates an a atmosphere and where they can influence youth. And so essentially they have the ability to influence another generation of people, if you will. And so this stature, this created stature or this manufactured stature that, uh, that they have becomes problematic if they use it in a way that it was not supposed to be used, meaning influencing people to engage in the status quo. That makes sense? And so I think the positive component about national athletes are these things, but also by these being positive, they also serve as a negative uh, by those who are attempting to maintain the status quo, right? Uh, while Bringing in international dollars is good, but engaging into an international discussion on issues can become bad. So uh, the significance of professional athletes is because of their reach and their ability to touch a vast amount of people uh, without being censored is, is, is very important and very powerful. Right? And so that's my discussion on professional athletes, black professional athletes and protests. Uh, if we have time for questions, I'll be more than happy to engage in questions and dialogue in terms of the importance of protests specifically, but also making sense of professional athletes and protests. Thank you. Yes. Um, if we have time for questions, I'll be more than happy to engage in questions and dialogue in terms of the importance of protests specifically, but also making sense of professional athletes and protests. Thank you. Yes. Um, there were other professional football players that helped the national anthem besides Polar Captain. Yes. Were they also censured? Uh, like he was. So, um, just recently, uh, Reed was able, he actually just signed a contract um, with Carolina Packers. Um, but what I'm getting at is there was a period of time, there was three core members that engaged in a protest for an extended period of time. It was Kaepernick, it was Reed, and it was Wayne. Um, at one point in time, they were all unrestricted free agents. Uh, Kaepernick, as we know, has not signed a contract um, and has not... Uh, and has not, uh, he hasn't been signed to a contract and he hasn't worked for anybody, worked out for anybody since the preseason. Uh, he worked out for Baltimore and he worked out for uh, Seattle, I think, this offseason. Uh, but that was the only uh, interest that he received. And so the point that I'm making is, uh, and we didn't sign a contract until uh, part, partly through the way uh, of the season last year. And so those three, and of course there were more, but those are the three that maintained the protest from its beginning through uh, the course of that season. They were all out of work for a significant period of time. And it's Reed that just recently resigned. He, he signed last year and he just got a three year deal. And Lane, I think signed a short term contract, but it impacted their interest in terms of other teams uh, immediately. And then for Kaepernick, uh, I don't see him playing for anymore. That's just my perspective. But uh, we can see the impact on him um, more specifically. Um, and as for those who engaged in the protest, there are those who participated but didn't articulate why and engage in a discussion 
around uh, the purpose or the function in terms of their protest. These three um, have uh, engaged in a discussion and consistently uh, talked about why they were protesting. So does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. oh. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Another question? Um, I read somewhere, and I think it was in a magazine like Time, that um, when Kareem was at UCLA, that he had political aspirations at the time. I mean, thoughts about you know, inequalities of black people mm -hmm. and so on, and had that the team, um, when he was there, in certain parts of the season, something actually did not come out during the national anthem, but stayed in the locker room until it was time to play basketball. And it was related to him and his protesting. And I was just wondering, I never heard that as an issue until I read the article. Yeah, there's, there's a number of people who uh, demonstrated this is not the first, even in the NBA, for example, there was, uh, in the 90s, there was uh, Radu, uh, Rad, 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 Rad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he didn't come out, well, at, at certain points, uh, he demonstrated, not necessarily demonstrated, he didn't partake in uh, the traditional hand over heart standing up for the national anthem. And so the league uh, negotiated with them and it, it came to, he didn't have to come out during the national anthem. Uh -huh. And so the national anthem hasn't been the first time, or this hasn't been the first, of course, you know, Tommy Smith and, and uh, John Carlos, but there have been numbers that, uh, a number of athletes that have targeted the national anthem as a platform to engage in protests. Some of them are direct protests to say, I'm protesting the national anthem. And there's indirect to say, well, uh, because of whatever reason, I don't see it fit for me to acknowledge the American flag or the Star Spangled Banner. Um, but also, and to that note, there have been a number of athletes who have remained silent as well for those who have protested um, and have attempted to protest. Um, and I'll piggyback and I'll go to another. And I think it was 1991. Uh, yes, 1991, it was the NBA Finals. It was the Lakers and uh, the Bulls, unfortunately, the Lakers. Craig Hodges. Say that again? Craig Hodges. Yeah, Craig Hodges, right? He attempted to influence the players not to play in game two, I think it was. It may have been game one or two. It was game one, actually. I'm sorry. And he tried to persuade Michael Jordan and uh, Magic Johnson to boycott just the game in general, right? Because of what happened during the uh, Rodney King uh, uh, verdict. Or no, it wasn't. It was when the incident happened, not the verdict, but the uh, when the tapes were released on media that showed the beating of Rodney, uh, Rodney King, right? And the response was, of course, that he was crazy, right? And that they, they, they did not support such thing. But the point that I'm making here is there have been a number of uh, players that try to use professional venues to be able to resist and bring certain issues to light. In that same vein and in the, on that same token on the other side, there have been players that have remained silent. And this is not to critique Magic Johnson and, 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 uh, and, uh, and Michael Jordan. This is to say that even in things that are not so considered so radical, people are not willing to do. Um, so for example, the track athletes did get together, but only John Carlos and Tommy Smith engaged at that particular time to, uh, in, in, a, in a form of protest. But there were others to say, man, I don't want anything to do with it. And it's the same thing with Kaepernick. There are some players that voiced, man, I do understand his rationale, but I won't do it, right? For whatever reason. But part of that reason is job security, right? That's real. That's job real. security. And so again, going back to that agency reduction, that becomes a force to be able to influence your behavior, if you will. Got a question? No, I was just going to make a statement that, you know, in the, I don't know, the, I think the 80s and 90s and seventies, and that was the 
large numbers of black people in the stands would remain seated or would not put their hands over their hearts or that kind of thing during the national anthem. So, you know, this was not a new form of protest. It was just being um, promoted more visibly, highlighted by these athletes to some extent, by, by the, them choosing to support the black community who were also making this, you know, form of, of protest and, and, and perhaps not even getting any visibility, you know, uh, when they did it by themselves in the same Yeah, I think one of the things that, a part of this discussion for professional athletes, it's very complex, but part of it is professional black athletes are supposed to represent something for the African-American community, right? To a certain extent, they're supposed to represent the ability of African-Americans to move upward in terms of uh, prestige, but also economics. It becomes a... a, a it becomes a image for upward mobility, if you will, right? If this person can do it, this means that anybody can do it to a certain extent, right? And so for, for professional black athletes, they're supposed to represent, and part of that representation is to be a model for the black community to a certain extent. And so by utilizing that, that venue to be able to engage issues who, uh, that are going on in the black community, it undermines what society has projected their role and responsibility to do. Yes, they are to entertain and generate revenue, but they're also supposed to represent that individual to say, all right, if you play the game right, if you just work on your skills, you can make it just like this individual is. And so when individuals engage in protest, it undermines that image, if you will, right? Because that image is not supposed to be utilized in that manner. Again, that image is supposed to maintain the status quo, and the status quo is, you know, shut up and play basketball, right? You do it right, you will be rewarded, if you will, right? That's a part of it. And it's more complex than that, but that's one of the aspects that's important to understand the role of professional athletes. It's not, it is entertained, but it's also to serve as an image for other African Americans to follow behind. There's a reason why Craig Hodges is where he is and Michael Jordan is here where he is, right? There's a reason why what happened to Muhammad Ali happened to Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier had a different kind of experience. While Joe Frazier wasn't, you know, uh, drafted, but it's a reason why these things shake out the way they shake out. There was a, a saying, uh, that this athlete or this entertainer was a credit to his race. Mm -hmm. And that saying meant that those people did not rock the boat. Mm -hmm. They, they uh, went along with the status quo of that time. So conversely, these athletes are rocking the boat. So to the others, they are not a credit to their race, if you can see yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very complex. So like with that, yes, individuals that are engaging in these protests, they're rocking the boat. Um, and so that becomes problematic because they're utilizing that venue again to do something that it was never intended to do. Um, and on the other end of that token, sometimes, you know, we don't want to. Re we don't want individuals, our professional athletes, to represent who we are. So, and that's another complex component about it. So, like for example, with Dennis Rodman, right, uh, who engages in resisting the status quo, but not necessarily in terms of preserving African people's humanity to a certain extent, right? And so it's complex because this whole question is. Who's actually fit to articulate the needs and the demands of a particular community, right? And so part of this conversation, for example, with Malcolm X, he stated, uh, why does me media outlet sources go to entertainers and ball players to be able to discuss the political, um, the politics of the black community? Are they fit? Are they experts on, on what's going on in the black community, right? And so I'm saying that to say, why these, you know, these professional athletes have the voice and the agency to engage in this discourse, sometimes they may not be prepared to do so. 
right? And their engagement in some of these discourses might harm the black community more than it helps it, or maybe create more confusion than it does clarity. And so I'm just saying that to say that it's very complex. While we do want you know, uh, professional athletes or anybody who has the ability to advance uh, an argument to be able to protect the livelihood and the humanity of African people, we also understand that some people just don't have the ability to do it and still try to, if you will, right? And so that's the complexity about it. Um, I think the thing with professional athletes, again, with them being in front of the mic, with them being able to travel the world, and so many ears are listening to what they're doing, how they're doing it, what they're wearing, how they're walking, all of these different things, it makes it very fitting for them to be able to interject messages, to be able to advance certain thoughts about certain things, or advance or open people's eyes about what's going on. And so it creates a very peculiar kind of environment um, that will be right only if it's utilized in the right way. Any other questions or comments? Right, he's not the rapper, was for the he was not a credit, it was more of a discredit to that Yeah. It's kind of funny, uh, I was at the investiture for the president, uh, Dr. Thomas uh, Pariam, and uh, one of the remarks uh, by those that were speaking was from uh, Dr. Wayne Nobles, right? And he was like, man, you know, the black community is kind of somewhat complex, right? Uh, that you represent us at all times. So, for example, if you do something that makes us proud, man, you're with us. And we applaud you for it. But when you do something that embarrasses us, it's like, man. You know, so it, it goes out to say, like, you're representing the black community. But that's our own internal understanding of what your role and responsibility is to the community to a certain extent. The thing is, when it's taken out of context and you place it in another kind of avenue, such as a professional athlete, it changes the game to a certain extent, right? Because on one hand, they're professional athletes that are tied to organizations that mandate that they safeguard the principles of the organization that they work for, right? So when it comes to their connection to the community, it's a matter of, you know, where does your allegiance lie to a certain extent, right? And so, it just makes it very complex. But nonetheless, they still represent us. They, they, this is still home for them. And so, um, yeah, this is still home for them. Now, I was just going to add to that by saying, you know, the media plays into that too. Because, Definitely. you know, uh, an individual may think that they're representing in one way, but when the sound bites are manipulated in another way, the media can really change the intent of the individuals attempt to influence, you know? Yeah, I think one of they misspeak or say something totally bizarre or awful like Tanya. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like one of the issues that I think is very, very important now that's being discussed in professional sports, more specifically in basketball, is this whole free agency, the politics around free agency, mm -hmm. right? So for example, the player's ability to actually advocate for agency to say, man, I want to be able to say where I want to go, right? And the league having policy against that to say, man, you don't have the right to do. But yet, on the other end, uh, organizations have the right to trade you whenever they want to trade you without saying anything to you. You can see on the TV, you've been traded, right? <laughs> and there's not absolutely nothing wrong with that. The point that I'm trying to get at is in a discourse around agency and humanity, at what point are you trying to tell me I have no right to advocate for me as an individual to be able to dictate where I want to go and where I don't? And so when I talk about African people preserving their humanity, us being a part of institutions that within the letter of their law rejects our ability to be active agents for ourselves, that becomes problematic. To, to, to a certain extent, it almost says that you're a slave and you are owned by an institution because you are contractually obligated and because of the contract, you're obligated to engage 
can act in a certain way. But on the other end, the organization has no obligation to you whatsoever. They can cut you. They can trade you. They can make you sit and never play again. They can do almost what they will, right? And so that whole negotiation of how do you maintain agency and this talk about how institutions either preserve African people's culture and worldview and uh, allowing them to preserve their agency becomes very dynamic in terms of even some of the discussion. And I know it hasn't blown up to this, but at the end of the day, it really boils down to that for me. Had a question? No, I was just gonna agree that Anthony Davis, as an example, yeah, you can trade me, but you can't get me to resign. Yeah. And so that becomes the conversation. And if and he has taken a fifty thousand dollar, you know, um, hit mm -hmm. for the statement of basically saying that listen, I'm telling the world I want to be a Laker, just as an example. And that's another thing. You get fined for even saying I want to be traded. It wasn't even that I want to be a Laker. He had he he uh, received a fine for requesting a trade. So where did the agency in that? Well, he's engaging in arguably anti-competitive behavior. So he's engaging in antitrust is in essence what they would say, meaning the teams for that matter. And I get that. Uh, currently, currently uh, Sprint, and I know this is a different thing, but Sprint, and what is it, T-Mobile? Yeah. Just signed a contract. Is that anti-competitive? You know, within the markets that are the industry that they're in. And so I guess what I'm saying is the door doesn't swing both ways. Right. No. Yes. Understood. Yes. And so the advantage goes to corporations yes. more than it does the individuals. Yes. Of course. And we can see that play out in sports in this regard, where individuals lose completely loses their agency while the corporation maintains their agency by all costs. In fact, they write policy to make sure that they maintain their agency, and they write policy to make sure that individuals lose their agency. Yeah. Yeah. I think the agency is great, but I look at oh, it as yeah. a corporation because those student athletes are treated like they're slaves, and they don't have any say so in anything that goes on. Yeah, student athletes is a totally different thing. Um, the whole discussion about getting compensated for being student athletes versus not being compensated. And uh, the NCAA arguing that, you know, you getting pre uh, tuition is a form of compensation that's beyond the value of the dollars that you would receive to but be financially compensated. They're not able to work a lot of people that they're hungry, you know, they're not allowed to work because all they have is academic and then they're practicing. And so they have, you know, yes, they get free tuition, but they don't have money to buy the essential things they need, like right? personal <coughs> items and things. If it's not in their area where it's closed, they're still hungry, and they're, they're a lot of them saying they're going without food, without clothing or whatever they need outside of the athletic work. I, I think they should be paid. I know that's a whole other topic, but they should get some kind of compensation. Sure. <laughs> I agree. You see a way in all these big schools make big time money off of them. I agree. Jerseys and their names and my likeness and all that. You sell. You sell. I agree, man. The, the, the TV contracts alone. Have you seen some of the money with these TV contracts alone? Uh, it, it's crazy. But I will still say, going back to the players themselves, this whole notion of having agency versus those who don't. Um, so even if you were to look at the NCAA, for example, and the rules around you switching schools, for example, and losing eligibility for one year, the whole compensation. But if you look at the institution itself, or even coaches for that matter, right? Coaches can leave one job to another job um, and actually still receive the money from the contract that they sign, as well as receive compensation for the new school that they're in. The coaches are also paid more than the president of the university. In some cases, yeah. But the point that I'm making is, the point that I'm making is, um, the agency component is very important because it creates a level of dependency for these, these, these professional athletes. Now, LeBron is one thing, but if you look at other players, you know, it's a different. They're not moguls like a LeBron. And so their dependency on the league 
actually influences their behavior in terms of what they're willing to do and what they're not willing to do. Well, so don't get me wrong, there are some players that say to hell with it. I am who I am and I want to say what I want to say. But understanding that policy does restrict agency for some players, right? And when you, you talk about NCAA, it's a totally different thing, right? The level, the, the stakes are much higher and the compensation is way down there and lower, if you will. I was just going to say that the talent is your way of retaining agency. The more talented you are, the more you're going to retain your agency. Because at some point, people are still going to give you a chance. Kareem Hunt, as an example, was just signed by the Cleveland Browns yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so once you reach a certain level of talent, it negates or it gives you passes with your agency that others don't. LeBron being a different animal, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, in terms of his impact. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I mean, also with Tom Kaepernick is that he started something that that challenged the whole league because they had players from all over the league trying to find out how, how are we going to protest them? So we going to stay inside the locker room? We going outside? Everybody going to be you know, sometimes they could have before the anthem and then stood up during the anthem, you know. And I think because of that, that's the main reason why he's not playing today. We blame him. No, I think. One of the things I didn't get to discuss, which I think is very important, is the league's response to uh, the demonstrations during the national anthem, which is very important, right? Um, after the year uh, that passed in terms of uh, players protesting and things such as that, there was dialogue about the protest, but also there was policy that was passed. It was later rescinded, but there was a policy that was passed that, that, that uh, prohibited any, those who were on the field from actually kneeling or sitting so on and so forth, right? And so this was very important. Well, for me, it was very important, right? Because there was other policy passed during that same off season, right? There was policy passed around domestic abuse. Actually, domestic abuse was passed prior to season, but it was reinforced and uh, renewed. And so, one of the things that I pose to myself is, what was the stance on, uh, by the league on treatment of people of African descent based on the policy that they passed? What was the stance by the league on the treatment of African Americans by law enforcement and the criminal justice system? It was okay looking. That could be one thing. There was no stance. Yeah. The only stance that they said is, when we play the national anthem, stand up. But right? isn't that the they, they separate issue. It is a stance. thing that happens is, there's an issue. People respond to that issue, and other people say, well, that's, let's not talk about that issue. Let's talk about your response to that issue. Okay, which so is the flag, kneeling, Blah blah blah, but the issue of how people were treated, which was the initial response, they don't really get into that. They okay. bypass that. Okay, so yes, back out of that. What's the least stance on domestic abuse or domestic violence? Huh? They did not condone it. They didn't condone it, and in fact, they they passed policy. It's a no tolerance. Those who engage in it will be penalized to a very severe extent, right? Even if criminal charges are not brought against, the league can actually punish and do punish individuals because it's a no tolerance, right? And so now, that's not me trying to compare the two or do some type of competition between domestic violence and uh, issues going on in the African-American community. The point that I'm making is, even in policy, institutions and corporations, they take stances. And those stances make certain points. And so as it relates to people of African descent or African American community, law enforcement, and criminal justice system, there's a stance that the league actually takes, which basically is a stance, no stance at all, or a, it's none of our business. But when it comes to domestic violence, while they should write a policy and there should be no tolerance, the point is it's not universal, right? There's no concern. Now they did, you know, uh, 
agree to invest money in the community, not even around uh, law enforcement and criminal justice issues, but in terms of community development. But as it relates to criminal justice and law enforcement and the community itself, there's no stance on it. There's no stance, and that's something that's very big. Because at the end of the day, it boils down, what does the league feel about the humanity of people of African descent? They, they care about image. It, their response, even, even, even to harass or whatever it is, they, they pull together the owners uh, of our management, and they said, what can we do to preserve our image to the public, not how can we address issues? So there, there's a difference in what they do. Mostly what they're doing is, is protecting the image of the sport, which is dollars and cents. And I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Come yeah, in. I would piggyback on a lot is that society as a whole cares a lot about, cares more about domestic violence than it does about the mistreatment of African Americans. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's not as popular to take a stance and to have a policy discussion on it. I, I would agree with that. I'm sorry. Isn't that the whole idea of Black Lives Matter? That's the I mean, point that's, that I'm... That that's, that's, the that's the whole point of saying Black Lives Matter. Not nobody else matters, but that just like you take a stance on these other things, we want you to recognize that Black Lives Matter as well as every, all these other things. And that's the point that I'm making that I was going to make is that the value that's attached to black lives, it has no value much to the point to where it impacts the image of the, the, uh, the league itself. Whereas domestic abuse, while it should be recognized and it should be policy, it's valuable enough for us to take a stance on it and us to show that we have a no tolerance policy on that. And in fact, those who engage in it will be uh, uh, punished to the full extent. The point that I'm making is their statement on the issues that were around the protest is saying that it's not valuable enough for us to take a stance, to be able to intervene or even make a comment on. There's no one that hasn't even made a comment. In the sense of they acknowledge unfortunate incidents that have happened, there has not been a league stance to say, we stand against ill treatment of African American community by law enforcement and criminal justice. There hasn't been any statement or policy that that, that that supports that, which to me says it's not valuable enough. And it does not impact the image of our league if we don't. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Question or comment now? But you know, as pertains to domestic violence, they didn't care about domestic violence either until there so many high profile athletes ended up in court for these horrible things that they did. I know. That's the only reason they started caring about it. And I agree, I agree to that. I agree to that. I guess what I'm What's important for us to understand is, you know, domestic violence, it's, it's no comparison, and I'm not trying to compare it. That would be, that would do a misjustice to both incidents. However, what I'm getting at is the treatment of African Americans by law enforcement and even the criminal justice system. We can go down the list in terms of, you know, how African Americans specifically are impacted by these two entities have been happening for hundreds of years. And so they've been impacted for a long period of time, just like those who are victims of domestic violence. Um, however, I think from the land, the, the, the lead taking a stance on domestic violence, as they should, they have not seen something that has propelled them enough to say, this is valuable enough for me to stick my neck out. And even if I receive backlash from law enforcement or even the criminal justice system, I'm willing to do so. Because it's that <laughs> important to me to do so. Um, and I think that their perception of it reflects society's perspective of uh, the relationship between law enforcement and the criminal justice system. That it's just not valuable enough to do so. Why? Because black humanity is not valuable enough to preserve um, to a certain extent. People of African descent are not human. Therefore, the treatment of them uh, is acceptable if it is inhuman, right? And so, while they're not directly saying that, it's kind of like they say, "I can speak louder than words." Your actions are telling me these things, are saying these things in a number of different.
would take one more, and then I, I don't know how much time we got. I'm, I'm fine if you're okay. Oh, okay. When the president spoke out on this, I think he had to decide because uh, he had already been saying things about in some of the rallies about like when the police arrest people, how they should be treated. And then this happens, and he's piggybacking on the same thing. And you know, all these tweets and different things going back and forth. It didn't help situation at all in terms of how people people's perception of what was happening. Yeah, a changing point in terms of the literature that I reviewed, the changing point in terms of the league's response to demonstration was uh, President, uh, or he wasn't a president then, but uh, he was a presidential candidate uh, at that time. Therefore, <coughs> our policy is going to be wrapped around preserving the national anthem. And so, yes, the president's comment did change the trajectory of the, even the discourse around it. And you start to see teams breaking away from their, their, their solidarity with the players, moving toward a policy around the national anthem. Yeah. In terms of protest? Yeah, protesting. I don't. Well, I do know this. I do know this. OJ is a good figure to bring up because when they had the 70, the 67 summit, OJ was actually invited to come to the summit. And this summit was supposed to be uh, to bring support for Muhammad Ali and his decision not to go to the Vietnam War. And OJ refused to actually be a part of the summit at all, right? In fact, his response to uh, him being invited to the summit was like, man, I'm not a black athlete. I'm just an athlete, if you will. And so I didn't bring up OJ because he didn't, he didn't engage in no protests. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Michael Jordan. But yes, he, he would be that individual who would maintain the status quo and, 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 and uh, remove himself within the context of the Malayan Union. So, thank you all for coming out.